Hello. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, <clears throat> I rather underestimated how much time uh, I had today. I thought it was a full hour, but I think it's about 45 minutes. So I was rather a little bit generous also with the amount of content I'm going to show. So um, we're going to get to that pretty quick because it's about 18 minutes worth. Um, but I think it's actually a very interesting cross-section of work because it crosses um, what I consider to be sort of, well, 3D genres, types of 3D. People will <clears throat> have often spoken about, and of course this is the, always the most paramount thing um, to consider whether you're shooting in 2D or 3D, is your storytelling. Because we are the masters, we are slaves to, to the story. The story must be paramount. Um, but what I haven't actually heard spoken of uh, is um, audience expectation of 3D. And that does change as much as anyone's expectation would change of, of a genre movie. Um, so this piece will actually start with uh, the entire London Eye um, 4D experience movie that, that um, we created back in 2009, myself and Phil Strether, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and that is essentially a ride movie. It's an attraction piece. It's, um, it will, I hope, debunk or expose also some of the myths about um, having lots amount of stereo in your, in your piece. Because obviously, some, something of this nature, uh, people have a very high expectation of what they're going to get from a ride movie, from an attraction piece. It does, we, we ha have, um, stereo shots that uh, exhibit as much as probably 10 to 12 percent um, depth budget. Uh, this is an enormous a figure if you consider that most people are conservatively talking about, for certainly for, for feature length movies, 1 percent to 1.5 percent. I typically, Phil and I both typically work to about 1.5 to 2.5 percent. But I wanted to show you that because that, A, it, it a, to illustrate that this is not something to be afraid of. Of course, this is not the kind of 3D that you can, um, can exhibit throughout an entire two-hour feature-length movie because it will be taxing. The nature of these pieces are that they are brief, they are short, they're four minutes, this sort of stealth hit and run. You're in there, you glove it, you're great, and you're out. Um, but what is important about this is that the, the, the techniques used here still apply whether I'm shooting this, or as you'll see later, I, sh I show excerpts from Carmen and Madden Butterfly. You know, you, you, two, two genres, if 3D genres, if you like, that couldn't be further apart in terms of 3D expectation um, and, and just sort of general content either. One is obviously considered quite highbrow, cultural. That would be the London Eye. <laughs> um, no, but the, but, uh, and the other is, is um, you know, just, um, I wouldn't say frivolous, but it's, it's fun. It's entertain just pure entertainment. Um, I also like to, um, sit, well, I'll come to it later when I, when I explain about the London Eye again. Um, this is using very much what people would term as gimmicky 3D. I hope, because it was all, always my, my um, goal on the outset of this, that you'll see these as not gimmicks, that these are not cliches. They're using neg high negative um, sort of uh, uh, stereo experiences. But it's not a pointy stick that coming out at you arbitrarily just trying to, for the sake of it, point you, uh, you know, poke you in the eye. This is to give you a sense of uh, proximity, a sen uh, immersion, a sense of fun. Um, but every single one of these effects was very, very painstakingly carefully conceived with the story to make it all work fluidly together so it's not arbitrary. Everything seems to flow from one effect to the next. And there are very, very precise ways in which you do that. So you measure your stereo so you can do that and it remains comfortable. Anyway, so I'll let you watch this. And then we have a frame of reference after which then I can discuss the comparisons between both shows. Thank you. There, first of all, I should have probably um, announced that um, uh, London Eye does start in 2D. So I saw people sort of were, ch were sort of checking their glasses. It does. That was an intentional, uh, it was intentional on my part because um, I think, as probably Chris Parks touched on a little earlier, there are, there are ways in which we try and use um, 3D to um, not obviously just create dimension, but we're creating dimension and we want to um, uh, 
create uh, an emotional response as well. And for me, the beginning of that London Eye sequence was all about this little girl that couldn't actually see properly because things were obscuring her on a day trip with her dad. Things were obscuring her views. She can't see properly. And I actually wanted to start out with that quite claustrophobic. And I thought, we're in a 3D movie. You can't get more claustrophobic in terms of com com compressing space than starting in 2D. So I thought, I'd just start that in 2D. And actually, as it, as it shows in the venue, it's slightly more immersive because it's a bigger, wider screen. Uh, larger format, um, so you, I think you're less aware that it's 2D, but you kind of know that something's up. It's not quite, you know, what your expectation of, of it was until the bird starts to arrive. And then uh, when we do have that bird finally coming out, the scene for me is sort of, this is the, the, the epiphany, this is the big sort of uh, um, money shot moment where we, where, where we start to delight and enjoy and engage in, in, the, um, in the movie. So um, what I want to do is just sort of take you through, and I apologize that people write on the flanks as well, because when you are working with uh, some real, real extreme offsets that we do get, uh, such as in the London Eye, um, you know, the three does, it really does break down a little bit on the sides, and that's just, um, that, that uh, sadly is a slight drawback of the medium itself when you really are watching from oblique angles, but as I was as well. Um, so what I wanted to do is just sort of um, go through some examples of um, how I structured some of those shots. Initially, you'll see with the London Eye, and then show how uh, the same sort of rules applied um, to uh, Carmen uh, and Madame Butterfly, but just everything is scalable. You just sort of scale, scale your 3D down a bit, um, uh, because obviously, you know, I, we, we, we want to, um, in the um, instance of, uh, of the opera, um, you know, the, the, the aim is to try and simulate or get a feeling of being there, of, under, of the space and the geometry, uh, but obviously we don't want Madame Butterfly literally lap dancing um, right in front of us. So, so there you, you, know, you kind of want to dial everything down. Um, so it's also less taxing on the eye for two hours. So I'll start with um, just a, 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 a little example of now, this is not in stereo, so don't, don't worry about putting on your glasses. What, it, what this is is a 50-50 overlay, so I can just show you uh, the offsets that we have here. Um, and as you can see, our bird has come, uh, uh, this is sort of at his peak when he's uh, in the greatest negative space here. We have a fairly generous, I think it's about 5-6% um, um, negative offset here, and you have about 1% um, uh, positive parallax in the background there. So, you know, between six or seven percent overall in that shot. Um, now, that, that is asking quite a lot mechanically of, of your eyes. You know, the, our eyes are instruments, um, biological instruments. They, they, you know, we have muscles, a muscle reflex in order for them to converge and focus on objects in space. And typically when we watch a 2D movie, actually our eyes are focused on this screen plane the entire time. We're not actually asking our eyes to physically um, converge or change um, uh, it, toe in or do anything like that throughout the length of the movie. Unless you, you know, you, the minute you turn around and maybe dip into your popcorn, your eyes are going to sort of focus on that and then you go back to the screen, but that's it. Whereas in 3D movies, we're, we're always asking your eyes to, to uh, we're manipulating them all the time. Um, and so that, um, Purely because we're not robotic, we are biological in nature, and our eyes do not actually snap from one state to another instantaneously. Um, what we try to do when we're doing in 3D is to massage your eyes to, to the next state. So it, it's, doesn't, it's not painful, it's not disorientating in any way. Um, and that's, in a sense, how you make comfortable 3D, um, which is always our first goal. Um, but then I think there's also, there's a next state in which we, we also try to make, apart from just comfortable 3D, great storytelling 3D, that, um, you know, is to make elegant 3D. Um, and so, you know, there, there are certain sort of techniques, I guess, uh, whatever I myself pick up along the way or have, have tested or trialed and, um, in eight or nine years of, of, of mucking around with this medium, you know, um, and of course, at the outset, I played with all the bells and whistles like most people do when they get their hands on it um, for the first time and made you know, my errors and, and so on. But um, I am hoping that um, you know, I, 
certainly from the, the London Eye and with Carmen and with Madame Butterfly, what, what, what that, those projects have allowed me to do almost now is, um, particularly as this sort of skill set is developing across the industry um, uh, uh, in general, uh, now being able to collaborate with individuals who also have an understanding in 3D. Um, you can communicate your, your, your desires, your intentions much, much quicker than one used to, be, used to have to, you know, an awful lot of your time was spent actually sort of explaining or m your motives for why you were setting something up. And now, you know, most of your time is, is based actually on, on um, you know, the creativity, what you actually want to get from that shot rather than sort of having to justify why you're doing things in certain ways. And this is, you know, and this is because, you know, the, the industry at large is adopting it. People, people are, again, through, through um, uh, uh, conferences such as this one, Ravensbourne, BVE, and so on and so forth, that people are getting um, uh, skill sets program, people are, uh, uh, are skilling up on this and they're beginning to understand. So if I just give a, 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 a brief summary of what's really going on here. Um, so excuse me, a rather elegant, inelegant way of, of um, explaining this, but if we, if we start with our, um, uh, this is actually first frame of this shot here. You see that we have our 1% background um, parallax here. Um, and our bird is just clipping frame. He's just coming up here, and he's, he's also at about 1% negative. Um, at this point, <clears throat> he's peripheral. You wouldn't even have noticed him. Um, so I'm not I don't even really care that in, in, in stereo, he's actually being cropped here a little bit because he is in theatre space. But it doesn't really worry me because, to, to be honest, your attention is drawn here. Uh, you know, these, these things are sort of set up in a way. I mean, what you're, what you're really almost aiming to do with 3D in, in certain, to a certain extent is almost like being um, a, a, a conjurer, I think. It's a bit of smoke and mirrors. You're using distraction a lot, like, like, a, like, like a magician would. Um, you're asking people or you're directing people's attention specifically at specific places so that you can, you know, slip this in or that and, um, it, rather than just... Um, I wouldn't want to just cut basically, from this or the previous shot, which was the wide of the London Eye and the bird going up, which was just like a big, deep, wide, 1% um, uh, positive um, window shot. I wouldn't want to cut from that to, um, to our bird in this state here, because that was, that's exactly what um, it would, uh, I'd be exactly asking your eyes to snap into position, and that would be uncomfortable. So how I get around that, um, is I just simply, you know, I bring the bird to me. I introduce it. Uh, it's a beautiful object in flight. Let's use that. Let's use, you know, what this bird does naturally. I bring it to camera. So that actually, you know, so, so that takes place. There's a, there's a, there's a um, uh, over time, it's only two or three seconds, but that allows our eyes, you know, we, we become aware of this peripheral object. It comes towards us, we focus on it, and it gives our eyes time to adjust. Um, so that's just, you know, one fairly obvious. I mean, you know, you, it doesn't take long. It's not rocket science before you start to realize that these are the things that you can do. Um, and what, all you're really doing is actually trying to find out inventive. Every time you apply another uh, on another job or another shot or scene, you're, you're trying to find inventive ways of actually doing just this. How do I massage the eyes into uh, accepting the object? Um, so there's our bird. And um, so from this state, I've cut, I just wanted to come back to him flying off. And off he goes there. Now, there's also something very particular. Um, sorry, I'm not very good at this. Stop. Right. There's also something very particular about um, uh, why I've stopped at this point here. <clears throat> because our, our, our bird is now uh, leaving us, he's receding, he's going off into the distance. Uh, the parallax on him is now down as he got further away. At this point here, actually, um, you see he's more or less converged. Um, and again, these, this is not, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll qualify this in a, in a little while, but none of this is arbitrary, arbitrary at all. He is converged at this point here for a very, very uh, specific reason. And that is, when you're dealing with 3D, a lot of the time, it, you know, you really do have to have a, you have to be aware of scale. You're dealing with real solid volumetric objects. You're dealing with real scales. You want to be able to try and preserve those scales as best as you can, because uh, unless for some artistic reason you want to create miniaturization, which is a common side effect if, 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 you, if you're not handling your 3D correctly, that can happen. Um, 
uh, you know, it, it, it would be actually perfect. You, you know, for, in an example, for something like uh, Alice in Wonderland, shrinking her, you can actually use, um, you know, expand your interactuals in ways to actually really create a sense of her being miniaturized, which is a little trick I think they, they, they missed when they did Alice in Wonderland because it was all converted. But, um, but the reason I converged on the gull exactly at this point here is because that gull um, in real life is about a meter, its wingspan is about a meter wide. And in the, the exhibition screen that, that this shows in, that plays in at the London Eye, is about uh, six or seven meters wide. So at this point of convergence, the gull, in relation to the screen size, is exactly, the, is exactly to scale. So it, this is not by, again, this is not, this is not arbitrary, this is not by accident, and I, I keep mentioning that these things aren't by accident because it has relevance to how you prepare for 3D. Um, so if I just move on. Again, here's just another example of how I've uh, engineered it for the gull to sort of creep into that 5% area. And now I'm going to stop here. There's another little um, uh, 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 tip, if you, so to speak, if you like, <clears throat> about um, cutting from one object in space to another. And a lot of the time, people will mention that um, 3D doesn't sort of, it's very difficult to cut fast in 3D, or rather that that can be disorientating, that can hurt your eyes as well. And um, the, the, that is true. If, if you are asking, as I said before, if you are asking eyes to snap backwards and forwards and so on and so forth. But, you know, again, after a while, after, after playing with this medium for, for a little while, after trial and error, you start to discover all the little kind of secrets that want to, that want to emerge. And, um, you know, one that I found, and I think a lot of people subsequently as well, is that you can cut, actually, pretty much as fast as you like, pretty much um, as, as, as quick as you would in 2D. Uh, if you are, provided you're not asking those eye, your eyes to do anything different. So if I'm giving you an object that's out in space, and see, again, we're on a real healthy 5% here. Um, uh, if I was to cut, which I do there, to the same object, or a different object, doesn't matter, but more or less um, where your, your point of interest is on the screen, and at the same parallax, I'm not asking your eyes to to mechanically do anything different than what the, than the last shot was asking of them. So I could in, actually, in effect, cut back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, or to something else, something else, as long as I'm cutting to something that's, that's occupying the same place in space. Um, so, you know, these are, these are little tricks that you pick up on the way, that you develop, that you add to your arsenal, um, that, you know, that, that help you in, in terms of storytelling. So, you know, I want to debunk some of these myths that are out there that you cannot shoot in this certain way. You, you know, what you have to do, and this is paramount, and this is why I say none of this is arbitrary, is you have to prepare. You have to storyboard this stuff very, very carefully so that you can arrive at, at a point um, where you can cut those two, object, uh, two shots together. So you would have had to have prepared that. It's not, going, you're not, it's not something that you're going to necessarily be able to contrive later in post if you, don't, if you haven't shot the material in the first place in the right way. Um, again, I'll run through this very quickly. There's a similar example, um, shot by shot. Here's, here's, here's a little example of what people would call um, edge violation. We've got something, we've got our bird. He's creeping in right in the edge of frame here. Um, in this instance, um, I, I don't know if you're fam familiar with what edge violation means, but it's basically you've got two, 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 your two stereo images overlaid, but because they're being cropped here, or if you've got something in negative space being cropped here, that information is not, the information is not being shared because some of the offset is actually um, not on screen. And if I was to ever put an ob park an object right here, or, 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 then it would be uncomfortable. It actually not so much uncomfortable, just be distracting because you'd always, in the corner of your eye, you'd see something that's just a bit funky. 
Um, and as a general rule, well, we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. However, you know, when you're dealing with something that is a fast-moving object, by the time that actually reaches its, its, the, its again, it's the, the center screen, which is the point where I want you to focus on it, it's gone. You, you're not even aware of the edge violation. So in some instances, it doesn't matter. Play with it. Play with the stuff. You know. So, so. Um, uh, just want to throw that up as an example of where you know edge violation can be totally ignored. I mean, because it's just common sense. Um, and here again, uh, here is another example of um, just manipulating, massaging the eyes, if you like. But this, this, um, the bird was flying towards us. Again, we get this very, very big negative offset. Um, and I create this sort of zip zoom effect where I'm, I, you know, I pulled back through this um, scene, um, but sort of halted my time lapse, my time splice, if you like, at specific moments to tell this story. So this was all um, very theatrically blocked, um, which is something that, that works very well in, with 3D. And I think that's why, as well, mediums such as opera or, or live events work really well, because um, th um, you're able to, when, when things are sort of mapped out very theatrically, you can, you can see your point of focus. You, you understand where it is that you want, how you want your stereo to work with something. And it's not, you don't necessarily have to dip in with close-ups and so on. You use, again, you use sleight of hand, you use ways of drawing people's attention to, to the areas that you want them to concentrate on without necessarily having to chop things up all the time. Um, and this is another example of, of doing just that. This is, there are no cuts in this. This is all one fluid movement, but what I'm doing is I'm, 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 I'm compressing time and I'm slowing down at the points where I want you to concentrate. But every time I do that, I'm arriving at a point where the parallax, the negative parallax, is pretty much the same. So again, I'm not taxing your eye here. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the point being that all of this stuff is achievable and you can cut, through, cut fast, uh, 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 as I said before to emphasize, but you need preparation. You need to... Um, know what you're doing beforehand. You need to sort of conceive very well what your effect is going to be. Um, so here's just sort of examples of these are some of the concept stuff that I do, and then I go through and try and storyboard this stuff very meticulously um, with my stereographer so that we know that when we kind of cut these things together, it's all going to work very neatly. And that works and, uh, for something with as great a negative offset and a great big depth budget as the London Eye and is just as applicable to... Um, Opera to 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 uh, something like Carmen and Madame Butterfly, and here, for example, I think you might recognise this shot from the end of that clip reel, um, and I hope I'm not sort of disappointing anyone, <clears throat> but telling you that that was entirely stage managed. <clears throat> you know, she, uh, we got Leaping to go out and do a, a, a second curtain call on for our benefit. Um, I was able to show her this. Because I said, look, you mean be fantastic. I kind of want this angel wing thing going on. I want you embracing the house. I was able to show this to my, stere uh, my uh, uh, um, steady cam operator, Dominic Jackson, uh, communicate very, very rapidly, very quickly. This is what we need. This is what we want. And, and stereographers and pullers, and they knew straight away. Um, so so you, we could capture this stuff. But you, literally, if you're relying on chance, it's, you cannot get away with this stuff the way that you can do in 2D because what you end up in post, you'll end up with, you'll end up with shots that you think, oh, it's gorgeous and it's amazing, it's beautiful, and I really, really want it. And then you'll end up on the cutting room floor and you can't use it because the, because the stereo is not acceptable. So you really have to be to prep for this stuff. Um, Here's a, uh, some examples from Madame Butterfly. Uh, again, this is using exactly the same techniques or exactly the same principle, but just, just scaled down. So we see the offset on, on Butterfly here. It's, it's, I, it's about half a percent. I do cut directly from her to this is her mad Uncle Bonzo. And it's pretty relative. It's a little bit more, granted. But it's not enough, to be honest, to really tax the eye. So you know, we, we just flick through here. Here's another example um, where I used Dissolve to do exactly the same thing, in fact. Um, so uh, we're, we're actually coming out of this shot here, which is the wide shot, uh, and they're in 1% uh, uh, positive space in the background, and I'm dissolving uh, these guys through 
um, into 1% negative space through the shot. But because it's a dissolve, again, our, it, our eyes very gently move over and accept that 3D. But again, you can't, you can't even do that arbitrarily, um, as I, I just want, want to point out as well, because what you get in, in an example like that, you often get, if you're not careful, you'll get objects in space clashing. So if you see here, when I've, I've just, moved, uh, just moved the, the dissolve on slightly, I, you can just see remnants of the stars here, I think. And if you see that those, the offset, the, the remnants of those starts of the, out, of the outgoing shot uh, are pretty much or almost the same as the offset of the background of the incoming shot. So that's done very, very deliberately so, <clears throat> so that you know, the background sort of merges comfortably and I don't have weird clashes of, of scenery going on back there. Um, so you know, the, I think there's something coming up. Oops. Um, so here's an example of a push-in. Uh, you it, bring the camera to the subject or bring the subject to the camera. It's something I try and do um, as often as I can because I actually find it's a very elegant way of, again, you know, using the 3D because what you do, especially if you're moving on the z-axis, you're moving forward. A, you're eating, you're eating up that territory, so you're defining the space by doing so. Um, but you can also use it in ways that, you know, that work with the narrative, that work with the, the, the emotional um, resonance of, of the performance. So, um, you know, this is both form and function. You see in this piece, it, it, again, it, it's, it's not stereo, it's just 50-50 overlay. <clears throat> Um, the, the, it reaches a sort of emotional head, and I wanted, I wanted to be close. I want to be intimate with her at that point. Um, oops. So I'm not very good. I'll just let that play. So, um, you know, we, we, this actually started a lot wider, this shot as well. So we were converged on them, and they were, they were much further back. But slowly, during the course of the shot, I move in. Um, I'm inviting them further into negative space. Certainly her, if you see, he, he remains converged, we're on him, he's sort of, or even just slightly behind because of, um, the screen plane. And so we pushed in there and she's, she's actually, the, the parallax on her has opened up to almost about 1% by the end of this. So we're, we're you know, and if you notice as well, the, the cut between the two at that point there, I know I'm coming to that shot of him. I know I'm coming to a mid shot of him. I've storyboarded it that way. I want that mid shot of him to be in about 1% or towards 1% negative space. So I've contrived it also that the, the shot that leads into that ends more or less at the same parallax. Um, and I think I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> I've got to wind up fairly soon, haven't I? So let me get, let me get rid of this, and I just want to quickly go over some of the, the um, I think, frame forges probably. Um, so his, his examples of um, storyboards, quite literally, um, I think there's over 700 shots in Madame Butterfly, and every single one of those shots is storyboarded. Um, and that's uh, not I excessive. That's purely because, um, A, we need to control our stereo, uh, as I've said, shot by shot throughout this piece. Um, but also because when you're dealing, I'm sure this has been covered an awful lot of time as well, but when you're, when you're working in stereo, you actually want to be able to be as close to your subjects as, as possible using a sort of healthy wide angle lens because the, the, the longer your focal length, the more you compress that space, you end up getting this pancaking effect. Um, uh, which is, you know, very well covered. So for, for shooting Carmen, for shooting Madame Butterfly, uh, we needed our cameras very close, on set, more or less. Um, and so you're always running the risk of seeing your own camera in shot. Um, you know, so and that just can't, can't be allowed to happen. And over two, two and a half hour um, performance, um, you have to really make sure that your cameras are very, very carefully um, uh, uh, choreographed, more or less, so that doesn't happen. So it, we do literally... I do literally um, board the entire piece, um, and that helps. A, my, st my stereographers, they, they know, you know where we're leaving a shot, where we're entering a shot, how much, how much um, stereo to dial in, etc. So um, I think there was loads more to cover, but I think I've just run out of time. Really, it's been <laughs> it really has been fascinating, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry we, we can't go on longer. However, 
um, even though we're going into another session about 10 minutes, obviously we're going to ask if you can clear the area. And in that context, perhaps, Julian, you'd be happy to talk to some people outside Absolutely. here. Uh, I just want to emphasize two words that Julian's mentioned, which I think are marvelous. The one is magic, hmm. creation of magic, and the other is mucking about. Oh, there's an incredible that? sophistication in <laughs> mucking about, and sometimes not knowing exactly where we're going, but finding well, out is a really valuable <coughs> part, I think, of our artistic and creative Absolutely. Creation. I mean, this is, you know, this is, I've been doing this for 10 years, as is Phil Streather. And, we're, you know, and we've been worked very closely together. And we'd be the first people to come up here and say that we're still learning. And anyone that goes out there and tells you they're an expert at this and they covered all the bases and they know everything, I'm sorry, but they're best delusional. Um, you know, at worst, they're snake oil merchants. It's, it's, we're learning. Everyone is still. We're doing our best, you know, and, and that's what's fantastic. Every job uh, reveals something new and exciting and interesting, and you take that and apply it to the next. So, so again, thank you very much. Thank you.